Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program that features the lives of the saints and reflections on the Sunday readings, along with information on a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Corda. Our program is brought to you through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. Our interview segment today will feature Monsignor Jim Culp, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. We will also get a glimpse into the life and times of St. Maximilian Kolbe, along with reflections on the readings for this 19th Sunday in Ordinary Time. That and more on Wineskins. To tell us more about family life in the Diocese of Youngstown is Dave Schmidt. Have you ever noticed that we have a rather unique way of determining the size of our parishes in the Catholic Church? While other Christian denominations tend to describe their congregations as having so many members, in the Catholic Church we describe our parishes as having so many families. Why do we do that? Why do we judge our parishes by the number of families instead of the number of individual members? Well, it has a lot to do with our understanding of the family as well as our understanding of the church and their relation to one another. Think of it this way. The Catholic Church exists worldwide. After all, the word Catholic literally means universal. And this worldwide universal church is led by a special bishop in Rome called the Pope. But this universal worldwide church is divided into regional groupings called dioceses, each under the supervision of a bishop. In turn, each diocese consists of a number of local parishes, which are usually led by a priest as pastor. And what do parishes consist of? Families, who are usually led by parents joined together in the sacrament of matrimony. As you can see, families are the foundation of the church. In fact, St. Pope John Paul II took it further than that. He said that the history of mankind, the history of salvation, passes by way of the family. This is to say that strong families are indispensable to having a strong church and a strong society. Pope Francis echoes the sentiment when he describes the family as a family of families. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus taught us that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Certainly Christ's presence to the world is manifested through the church at all levels, universal, diocesan, and parish. But the most basic manifestation of God's presence in the world is through the family. With this in mind that each year, the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown offers its annual Faith and Family Festival. What is the Faith and Family Festival? It's a gathering of families and friends for fun, food, fellowship, and fulfillment, all in the name of faith. This year's Faith and Family Festival will take place on Sunday, September 23rd on the West Quad of the campus of Welsh University. If you are at all familiar with the Faith and Family Festival, you might notice that it has been moved to the month of September and on to Welsh University's campus. With these changes, we are forming a stronger partnership between the Diocese of Youngstown and Welsh University in this venture. While Walsh University has always been greatly supportive of the Faith and Family Festival, by moving the the event to September and on to the Walsh campus, we are making the event more accessible to the students at Walsh and their families. And we are giving families from throughout the Diocese of Youngstown greater exposure to the diocese's only Catholic university. Another change you can expect to see at this year's Faith and Family Festival is a greater emphasis upon music. We're planning a wide variety of music with artists such as Matt Schaefer performing polka to a Puerto Rican ensemble called Conjunto Riqueña performing Latino and Caribbean music to Felicia Landry singing gospel. The musical highlights of the day will be two nationally known Christian rock bands, Remedy Drive and Stars Go Dim. Many of the songs by Remedy Drive have challenging lyrics that deal with social justice themes. And Stars Go Dim is an up-and-coming band that you may hear played on Christian radio stations such as 95.5 The Fish. Finally, the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown will be a major theme of this year's Faith and Family Festival. In fact, we plan to have a cake baking contest with 75 cakes on hand to celebrate the 75th anniversary of the diocese. 
So mark your calendar for the Faith and Family Festival on Sunday, September 23rd, starting at 11 a.m., with opening Mass, planned with Bishop Murray. In addition to the music, there will be affordable food provided by Cafe Augustine, activities for kids, students, and families, a variety of vendors, opportunities to interact with religious order members and seminarians, the Sacrament of Reconciliation, and Eucharistic Adoration. As the vision statement for the Faith and Family Festival states, the Faith and Family Festival is directed towards the formation of families that, strengthened by the liturgy, devotions, and teaching of the Church, and by their common fellowship, they might go forth to be a leaven to the world. The festival is designed to be truly enjoyable and deeply spiritual at the same time. For more information, go to www.faithfamilyfest.org. We hope to see you there on September 23rd. For Wineskins, this is Dave Schmidt. St. Maximilian Kolbe was a priest and martyr. To tell us more is Barb Zorn. She is from Holy Family Church in Poland. This heroic Franciscan died in Auschwitz in Poland at the hands of the Nazis on August 14, 1941, and was canonized as a martyr by St. Pope John Paul II in 1982. Born in a little town in Poland, and given the name Raymond at baptism, he entered the Conventual Franciscans in 1907 and received the name Maximilian. He studied philosophy and theology in Rome and received academic degrees. He was ordained a priest in 1919. Because of his great devotion to the Blessed Virgin, he added the name Mary to Maximilian when he made solemn profession in 1940. He was convinced that the church was entering upon a Marian era, and he founded the Militia of the Immaculate, whose members were called Knights of the Immaculate. He constructed an entire city, which he called City of the Immaculate. As a missionary in Japan, he constructed a similar city near Nagasaki in 1930. He returned to Poland, and in 1939, the Gestapo took over his city of the Immaculate and turned it into a concentration camp. Arrested in 1941, he was sentenced to labor at the concentration camp at Auschwitz. When, as a punishment for the escape of a prisoner, a group of nine prisoners were condemned to death, Maximilian voluntarily stepped forward and offered to take the place of a married man who had a family. He died of starvation on the eve of the Feast of the Assumption at the age of 47. His body was cremated together with the other eight corpses. The prayers of the Mass emphasize the characteristics of this martyr of fraternal charity. The opening prayer begins with the statement, God, you have given to the Church and to the world Saint Maximilian, ardent in his love for the Immaculate Virgin and totally dedicated to his apostolic mission and to the heroic service of his neighbor. The reference to Saint Maximilian's Marian devotion and apostolate shows that he was striving not only to defend the faith and to contribute to the salvation of souls, but also to win one soul after the other for the Immaculate Virgin. This he did by using all the communications media at his disposal, publications, radio, theater, and cinema. He always said, hatred is not a creative force. Only love is a creative power. He said to the commander of the camp at Auschwitz, I am a Catholic priest and I am old. I want to take his place because he has a wife and children. After two weeks of starvation, an injection of carbolic acid ended the life of Maximilian. He was found sitting against the wall, his face radiant and his open eyes fixed on a certain point. As one person reported, it was as if his entire body was caught up in ecstasy. As early as 1920, Maximilian had written, 
I must become a saint as soon as possible. He had also said, Sanctity is not a luxury, but a simple duty, is one of Christ's first principles. Be perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. This same doctrine was proclaimed by the Second Vatican Council in its document on the Church. Saint Maximilian's Franciscan spirit of love and apostolic service, accompanied by his intense devotion to Mary, remind us today that whatever our state in life, we can, through the intercession of Mary Immaculate, combine an intense, active life with a deep, interior life of prayer. For Wineskins, I'm Barb Zorn. I'm talking with Monsignor Jim Culp, and we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. Monsignor Jim, if you could tell us a little bit about one of your first assignments, which I believe was St. Columba Cathedral. There's a rich history with St. Columba. Tell us what you remember about that. I was ordained, as you mentioned, in 1950 and assigned to St. Columba Cathedral. So I came here and I was, you know, you're a little concerned, you know, what's a cathedral going to be like and how you're going to be there. But it was just a wonderful place to be. And my senior Joseph Trainer was the pastor and uh, the associates were Father Jim Malone, but later Bishop Malone, Father Thomas Kelly and myself. The people were, you know, in Youngstown, the people seemed to have such a great love of priests that you just felt at home wherever you went. So I was there for seven wonderful years. I do have to say that one of the events that happened was not a fortunate one back in 1854. I was, I had heard confessions for First Friday uh, on a Thursday evening, and then I went over to the cathedral, and I was speaking with a young man over there, and all at once there was a pound on the door, pound on the door. I went to the door, and they, the church is on fire. Well, so immediately, of course, I went to the telephone, called the uh, fire department, then we realized that uh, there had been a thunderstorm, a violent thunderstorm, which had struck the roof of the cathedral, which had a lot of wood in it. So we looked, and uh, sure enough, the fire had quite a start. So uh, what uh, we did, my, uh, also Father Bill Picard was an associate with me. So what we did immediately, we went to the uh, altar to take out the Blessed Sacrament, and you could just hear the crackling in the roof. And so we uh, took the Blessed Sacrament out and we went over where the Sisters of St. Paul had their apartments there near their bookstore. We rapped on the door, you know, I think they were all safely, in, you know, in bed by that time, but they came to the door and we told them what had happened. So we put the Blessed Sacrament in their tabernacle. And then we uh, went back to the cathedral to try to take out vestments and various things like that from the sacristy mm -hmm. that could be salvaged at that time. So I remember standing there in the parking lot across the street with Bishop Walsh looking at the fire. And I remember I, I said to the bishop, Bishop, I did not finish my office, my divine office yet today. And he said, don't worry about that. So as I say, regretfully, the, the church did burn very, very much. And uh, Father Trainer at that time used to go out to near Lake Milton, Lipke Road, where he had a little place out there, and he was out there at that time. So I went the next morning to tell him about the fire. I didn't tell him how serious it was. We uh, came into town, and then, of course, we saw the cathedral, uh, what had happened to it. So, uh, as I say, that was uh, one of those things that happens, and it did happen. Sure. Well, thanks to you and the Daughters of St. Paul for saving our Lord in the Eucharist, first of all. But second of all, what was some of the reactions of people around the diocese seeing their cathedral, their beautiful cathedral, destroyed by fire? I think everybody was very, very shocked. Mm -hmm. They were very concerned about it and willing to help in any way that they could. Thankfully, it was insured, so that helped a lot. In fact, the insurance came to $940,000, but the damage was even more serious than that. Sure. Uh, one thing that uh, happened, the church had two beautiful towers, St. Columba Church, and uh, what they did, they really weren't able to salvage or to save the towers or any part of the church. So they took large cables and they took the one tower and swung it, swung it back and forth so that it landed right in the, the body of the church. Mm -hmm. 
And then the other tower, which was closer to the rectory, they put a large cable around that, swayed it back and forth, hoping it would land in the body of the church. But instead of that, it turned the other way and went through the cathedral rectory, which was where, of course, all of us were living, but we weren't, no one was in the house at that time. But that meant we all had to find a place to live for a while. That was uh, something that happened. And then something rather interesting too, uh, when the new church, when the new cathedral was, was built, it had a beautiful tower and it was going to have a nice crucifix, a nice cross at the very top of the tower. So it was on a Sunday afternoon, the cross was to be placed there by helicopter. And so people all around were watching this helicopter yeah. with the cable, you know, it was going to drop the cross into the place where it was to be contain it and then to remove the cable and go away. But what happened was the helicopter dropped the cross somehow into the place where it was to be, but it was sort of crooked so that they could not release the cable from the cross. Mm. So there the helicopter was, there was the cable fastened to the cross in the cathedral. So we all prayed very hard. Sure. And re thankfully, they finally were able to release the cable so that the heli helicopter could go away. <laughs> Where then did the diocese have its cathedral? During the time after the yes. fire. Well, what we first did, the first Sunday, we moved into the armory on Rayon Avenue. We had, of course, the altar and the... And then all, you know, sometimes you'd be there at mass and all much you'd hear a click for somebody. Somebody had gotten a, you know, at one of the, the vending machines in another part of the armory. But we, uh, we had mass there for a short time. And then we moved into what was really our garage of the Catholic Action Center. You know, we had a large garage there. So we were able to make that into a presentable place so that we could have mass there sure. for quite a while. Interesting. We know also that St. Pat's on the south side of Youngstown was named co-cathedral during some of the renovation and the building of St. Columba. For more information on that topic and other related issues, and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be right back. What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. By the time we can walk, each of us yearns for the joy that comes from being able to do for ourselves. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Church World Service. The song we have for you today is from the CD called The 40th Anniversary Edition of Earthen Vessels. It is by the St. Louis Jesuits. And you can find this and more albums at ocp.org. Take, Lord, receive all my liberty. My memory, understanding, my entire Yeah. 
Our scripture reflections for this 19th Sunday in Ordinary Time will be done by Father Scott Kopp. He is the pastor of Holy Trinity Church in East Liverpool. The college I went to had a bread factory right beside it. Imagine the cold winter mornings when you have no money left for the month. You're tired of studying, tired of living on ramen noodles, tired of walking to class so you don't have to pay for a parking pass. In the midst of this hunger and exhaustion, you smell it. It's a baking day. The hunger pangs get worse. You almost want to cry. The aroma attracts you. There is such a desire for just one bite of fluffy, warm, white bread. What would you have to sacrifice to afford the bread? The scriptures speak of the tantalizing smells and sacrifices as well. The smoke from the burning of the slaughtered animals in the Jerusalem temple rose up to the skies and was said to be a pleasing aroma to God. They also tell of the sweet smell of Christ's sacrifice, giving joy to the Father. Yet the animals were gifted to the people by God in creation, and the Son was sent from the side of the Father to the people too. There is nothing we can give back to God that did not originally come from God. It is also impossible to come to God unless God first put the desire to do so in our hearts. We all have this desire. The sweet-smelling aroma of the holy attracts us. St. Augustine puts it best, where he says that our hearts are restless until they rest in Thee, O Lord. We were created by God to be with God. The desire for God was put into our hearts at creation. St. Augustine is also one of the greatest writers on original sin, which can be defined as disordered desire. I want what I want, not what God wants for me. This was the sin of Adam and Eve. 
They didn't want to obey God. They didn't want to ask for the fruit of the tree. They took it instead and were punished. Their desire was clouded, as is ours still today. The connection to Jesus as food for eternal life comes with the fruit in the Garden of Eden, the fruit of the tree of life. Adam and Eve took this fruit. Jesus, as the true tree of life, gives us this fruit. His flesh as fruit is for the life of the world. The Eucharist, then, is not just something added by later church teaching. It is at the very core of our lives as Christians. We hear many people claim that they can pray by themselves at home for an hour on Sunday, and it is just as efficacious for their lives. This presents a grave misunderstanding of the purpose of the Mass and of the Eucharist. One cannot be taught by God except through Jesus Christ, and Jesus asks us to gather as a body. Body of Christ. It is not just about me, it is about us together. My absence on Sunday means one less voice to praise, one less hand to shake, one less smile to give. Someone else's experience of the Mass is lessened because I decided to skip. But at its core, the Mass is the celebration of the Eucharist, and this none of us can do by ourselves. We can pray all we want, we can sing all we want. But unless we gather our hearts around the altar and receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we will not be changed into Christ. We will not be an instrument of holiness and peace to others. We will not be true disciples in the world. The desire we feel in our hearts is the desire for community, the desire for love and understanding the desire for God connecting us to each other and to our Savior. Come then together. Come to the table of the Lord. Come to the place where all your desires are met. Come to the place where heaven and earth meet, where the divine and human are joined. Come to be with your Savior, the heart's deepest desire. For Wineskins, I'm Father Scott Kopp. The full truth concerning the person of Jesus Christ must include both his human and divine nature. He is so far beyond us that we can never be all that he is, and he is so much one of us that we can be guided by his example. Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. Wineskins is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Corda, thanking you for being with us. Have a blessed Sunday, and may God be with you. And please remember that this coming Wednesday is the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a holy day of obligations.